Hey, good morning, and welcome to the uh, the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club. Uh, this is our September 2016 choice, even though we're doing this in October, uh, for the wonderful Moon Cop by Tom. And and wait, let me do this. Tom, is it is it gold or Gould or gold? Gold. 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 Tom Gold. I, I was. I, I should ask that question before you before we start doing things. Um, terrific book, right? You guys, you guys like this? It's good stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We really, we really dug this. Um, usually, we start with kind of you and your career and 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 what's going on. So why don't we start with that? Why don't we start with uh, comics? Why comics? Um, um, well, I, I love comics ever since I was young. I guess like most people who make them, and I never really thought about drawing comics as a career. I went to college to do illustration, but I guess as I was there, I realized that illustrating other people's texts can be really fun, but the, the kind of control and excitement you can have actually using pictures and words to tell your own story was something I slowly realized was the most interesting thing I found in, in illustration and comics are one of the best ways of doing that. So when I was at college, I discovered Edward Gorey's work, which I guess isn't exactly comics, but is is in that kind of world. And I was reading at that time, Acme Novelty Library from Chris Ware was coming out in the pamphlets and Eight Ball was coming out from Dan Clowes. And just reading all those things, this is when I was studying at Edinburgh College of Art, and reading all those things just made me want to do comics. Interesting, so, interesting. And Go on. So, so when I finished Edinburgh, I I applied to come move to London to go to the Royal College of Art there, and I did two years in college there, and more or less spent that time telling stories with pictures and mainly drawing comics, and that's where I. As part of my course, I self-published my very first comics there. The uh, the the Royal College of Art, as I understand it, is uh, uh, very kind of I don't know high end. I guess might be the word that I, I might use. Was there any um, was there any pushback from any of your uh, uh, instructors uh, on on you know that you were doing comics? None at all, really, actually. I mean, I was in the illustration course, so I, I think illustration tutors have always been more into things like that. But I think also I was, I was, came, I started doing comics at quite a, quite an interesting time in Britain, I think, which was people were beginning to realize that comics were interesting for people like us. And about that time, Jimmy Corrigan came out and won the Guardian first book prize in Britain, which was a big deal. And so I think I was quite lucky in that people, my tutors were all supportive, but not everyone was doing it. So they were quite excited by comics. And so both me and my friend Simon, who I was self-publishing with, were quite lucky in that when our first comics came out, they were, it was quite a quiet time in British comics. and and. And we were, I think, given more attention because there was there wasn't a lot else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you did you read things like two thousand AD and that kind of thing as a, as a kid, or what was your your sort of youngest uh, experience with comics? My first comics, the first comics I read were Asterix and Tintin comics from France in English, mm -hmm. which were the only comics that my local library held. It's, I think at that time in Britain, it was pretty common that there was no comics in the library except for Asterix and Tintin and very occasionally a Lucky Luke comic. So those were my first comics and I absolutely loved Asterix comics. And I kind of liked Tintin comics, but for me, they always had too many words. I still think they have too many words. I, I remember as a kid thinking, if I want to read this many words, I'll read a proper book, you know. Whereas Asterix was more exciting and funnier and, and just appealed to me more. And from, so, so the library, those were the library comics. And also I would go to the, I, I grew up in Scotland, kind of in the countryside, quite far from, you know, the nearest shop was sort of five miles away. So we'd get taken to the shop on Saturdays and I'd get my comic, which was 
for a while was Battle, which was lots of stories about brave Tommies killing Germans. And I just loved all those stories. So, so Battle was the first comic, but then that kind of led in some of the same artists were working on 2000 AD. So as I got a bit older, I'd read 2000 AD. And then 2000 AD kind of led into all sorts of new comics because the artists working on 2000 AD were also working on more kind of indie comics. And so that led me on to reading Tank Girl and other things like that, which then led on to the whole world of independent comics. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the th- the things that I always see in your art is is that your protagonists there's a certain there's a there's a there's a distance, uh, yeah. and and it's interesting because the things that you're naming as influences are are really not that. Um, so what what do you attribute that to? That's a very badly stated question. Um, but do you, you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I, it, yeah, no, it, it's interesting to me. I think the gory parallel kind of makes sense for the distance. I mean, I think there's a distance there. Um, I think it's maybe just my personality. I'm a, dist- a distant and cold. I'm not a distant and cold person. But I, I was having a conversation with some cartoonist friend recently. I was saying I don't, I, I don't really like drama in my life. And I'm, I'm all, I almost find it quite difficult to put it into my comics, which I guess is why there's quite a lot of not very much happening in them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't quite know what to put that down to. I quite like, you know, Phil, I like early Jim Jarmusch films where not a lot happens and it happens rather quietly and that, that sort of thing appeals to me, but I'm not quite sure why. Um. In terms of uh, in terms of technique, I'm assuming, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that you're you're a pen and ink guy. Uh, yes. Not, yeah. Not, not, yeah. Not not digital. You know. Well, I use I I always use digital for the color, but um, mm-hmm. it's all drawn with the I draw it with these uh, pens, Uniball pens. Here we are. So nice. I don't. I I'm, I'm never. Never really got into the dip pen thing. It's too, it's too, I don't know, too too expressive or too. There's there's something which doesn't appeal to me. What appeals to me about the ball pen is you get a very. It's always the same line and it's quite flat and inexpressive, which is something I find kind of interesting to use. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you, uh, how do you? What's what's your process in terms of? putting together a book like Moon Cop. Um, do you script it all out first? Do you just start drawing? Because uh, we, we, we interview a lot of a lot of different cartoonists here, yes. and everyone has a completely different style. And I, I, we're, I'm always fascinated by this part of the process. Well, I think, you're, I think that it is a fascinating part of the process, and it's the fact that you're working with two different languages, the language of words and the language of pictures, and then on comics is kind of about how those two things interrelate and about the about how those things are are laid out on the page together and i think that's why making writing comics is quite hard especially if you're doing the words and the pictures because you're trying to make this thing out of two different languages and you kind of you can't move them both forward at the same time it goes in sort of slightly uncomfortable for me anyway slightly uncomfortable chunks so i um well to to take moon cop as an example uh i started quite quite early on i i had this idea for the story and quite quickly it came together in my head and i made this very small mini comic version of it which um i did very quickly in just a sort of afternoon or so uh, what does that say? Moon cop, yes. Uh, and it was—it basically has all the elements of the of the final story, but it's only twenty pages long, and it has a rather—I don't know—has everybody read Moon Cop? There. Yes. I'm not, so I, I can't do. Any, I, I won't accidentally do any spoilers. Well, not um, not for the people in the in here. People watching the video, maybe, but that's their um, problem. Well, well, basically, at the end, I know you probably can't see it very well, but the end of it is the donut shop closes down 
Uh, no, it doesn't close down. It keeps going, but they, it's now manned by a robot. So he, he, he meets the girl in the same way as he does in the story, but in, in, there's a kind of rather cruel, tragic ending that he's alone on the moon, which I kind of felt worked for a silly little 20-page story. You can have a bleak ending. But when I finished making the mini version, I sort of thought, I've got more to say about this character, and I've got more to say about um, the moon story. So then... Then I had to then, then I had to try and figure out how to make how to make it into a longer story, which is the thing I always find most difficult. I'm quite at home doing very short cartoons like I do every week for The Guardian and for New Scientist, but these longer stories I, I find I find difficult. So I, 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 it took me quite a long time, and I just have the story kind of in my head, and sometimes I'd write scenes. Um, just in a notebook like this, I guess th these ones are where I'm, I'm kind of writing it more like a movie script or just writing dialogue. But alongside that, I'd have I'll have my normal sketchbook, which I don't have one right. I'll just grab one. Yep. I'll also have a, a kind of more traditional sketchbook where I'm working on pages. Oh, cool. And then I'll also have just sort of scraps of paper with, with grids on them where I'll try and figure things out. So I, I get some, you know, can you see that at all? I don't know if that's seeable. Yeah, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I kind of have all these different things. Go I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not the person to tell you how to write a graphic novel because I'm always, when I finish a project, I think next one I'm going to do differently because this was too long and too painful and too difficult. Um, but I, I have all these different things going on at the same time, and I suppose slowly the story coalesces in these different forms until I get something I can kind of pin down on grids and start um, start telling the story with. Yeah, no, and it's not, uh, it, it, nobody has ever given us the answer of, of how do you do a graphic novel. I mean, literally it's, been literally different for each and every person which yeah. i again i find that fascinating because i think that if you talk to say novelists there's probably only two or three different ways to write a novel you know like a prose novel but when you yeah. talk about comics there's a nearly infinite number of ways to do so um and i yeah. I, I love that and i i think that's a, you know it's a little bit like with comic you there's so many parts of comics grammar and vocabulary that aren't even definite unlike um prose grammar which is pretty pretty clear and it's 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 interesting it's a much more i think it's a much trickier form to get your head round and really the only place the comic can come together is in your head um because of the the words and the pictures and all these different moving parts yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, I want to remind uh, our viewers who are on the internet because it looks like we have at least five people watching. That if you guys have questions, um, uh, feel free to put them in the uh, in the comments section. Is that is that right? Since we changed the little chat window, write your questions in the little chat window, and they'll get handed over to me and Boy Connect. And also, we're we're gonna go to some questions here in the room in in a minute or two. Um, let me let me just keep just a little bit further on on technique and craft. Uh, you you do. Uh, uh, strips in the Guardian, New Scientist, as you said. Um, there's a, there's a obviously a different rhythm in doing a short, you know, couple of panel thing versus doing a big long work like this. Uh, can you can you talk to that at all? Um, yeah, I mean, the, obviously the 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 craft element of drawing is is all the same. You know, I should have I should have finished my thought on that. Is it I, when I've when I've planned it out, I draw it all quite carefully in pencil and then trace it on a light box to get the neat finished artwork. And then I'll scan that into the computer and add color or, or just do cleaning up or fix any little errors there. So that, that element of the craft is, is always the same. But the diff, what's the difference? The, the, the lovely, the good things about doing a graphic novel is um, having more space to play with. You know, my cartoons in The Guardian, they're all, they're kind of about that size. So it's quite, um, 
it's quite difficult. It's interesting to fit ideas into that space, and I, and I really enjoy that. But what's nice about a graphic novel is is it could be as long as I want it to be, and you can take moments and stretch them out, or um, take one scene very slowly and then have something happen very quickly. And and that 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 thing of of drawing time on the page and chopping up the page into different panels to 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 tell your story in a certain way is the is the fascinating thing for me and the reason why I go back to making longer graphic novels even though I do find it quite a difficult thing and I also just love the fact that you've it, it's a whole book which is my, which is my story you know from I hope from the moment you see it on the shelf and you see the cover you're kind of beginning to be drawn into this story and I have you for the length of that story and that is that's a, a fun a really fun thing and using all those different skills of writing and drawing and designing and putting those together to make one holistic thing is something I love but yeah. on the other side the short cartoons are just so much more I can't I, I, I've been saying this a lot recently I haven't quite figured out the word for it they're they're kind of more pleasant and easier to do uh, I think maybe maybe ninety percent of the battle with a graphic novel or or maybe with any work of art is just convincing yourself that it's worthwhile and that you need to keep going on with it and with a short cartoon, I can just have an idea, and I only need to convince myself to get on with it for like three or four hours, and then I'll have a finished cartoon which I can then feel a sense of achievement and put into the world and and people can like it and and, and it feeds back and that's a that's quite a, a short thing which i i kind of can enjoy whereas the, the the work of getting through the graphic novel and not losing not losing heart in it or wor over worrying or thinking this is terrible everyone's going to hate it um is it's it's two quite two different pros you know i suppose the cliche is to say it's a kind of a marathon and a sprint the um the process when you're in the middle of it uh it, it, do you have any editorial um uh, uh, uh from from your editors at dark horse or ever uh, is there any is there any commentary that's coming into you is it just you and your wife looking at it do you stay totally by yourself like how, do, how does that work for you with the short cartoons i never show anyone them it's with they I, I i do them on my own i i send them into the the newspaper and then they print them and that's that's what happens they don't get to see a rough so nobody gets to give any feedback they once once the guardian edited me when i had the word bollocks is it bollocks yeah i had the word bollocks in sorry i shouldn't say that on your uh, on your no, that's fine, that's fine. They, they, made me, they made me take that out but that's one time in, in 10 years. And apart from that, they just leave me alone to do my thing. And I think if I did show it to someone, I'd start in a kind of uh, overthinking, worrying. And I, I, with those, I think it's best to just do it and get it out. And if it's not the best cartoon in the world, then I'll do another one next week and try and make it better. So I, I, I find that the best process and that works. With the longer books, I'm quite careful to get it started on my own. I don't want, I don't, I am, I'm easily discouraged. So I, I want to get something together that's kind of quite far on before I show anyone. I did, a, I, did a, I did the full story as quite a rough pencil draft. And then I, I show my, my wife and my friend Billy and they read it. And then I edited it a bit based around what they thought. And then I sent it to Drawn and Quarterly as the pencil draft. And they, with both of my books, have basically come back and said, this is great, can you finish it now? Because usually by that point, the book's already late, and I think they're just keen to get on with it. Um, so they, then, 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 I, then I just ink it and edit it a little as I go along and fiddle around with it a little. But... The problem with that technique is, you, is I end up with a stage at the end where really all I'm doing is drawing and cross-hatching and I'm not making any exciting decisions. And drawing 
all that cross hatching can sometimes have a lovely zen like feeling if i i can listen to an audio book and draw and sometimes it feels great but then some days it just feels like i'm not i'm being a robot and that sometimes i think maybe i'd be better to do it in sec maybe do a whole section and finish that and then move on but it's not how i've done them in the past yeah i can't remember who i can't remember who we were talking to who said that they went and they penciled it from start to finish and then they inked it from start to finish that was josh cotter yeah and i was like wow i can't believe that you would do it that way because that just seems like being so mono focused on on anything in particular um uh, uh in terms of of cross hatching it's it's a lot of cross you do a lot of cross hatching that that just yeah. seems like I, 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 how do you do that? I, like, I, I can't even, I'm not an artist, but I, it just, it, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that process because it seems so labor intensive. Uh, it can be, yeah. I, I did a book, I did a, a few pages for a big book called Kramer's Earth at Seven, which actually I've got here. Let me see. Um, I did some pages for this comic book, which is Sammy Harkham edited, which was um, is a huge, a huge book, and I cross hatched these pages. And this was this was my possibly my most extreme cross hatching experience. I did the story of Noah's Ark in four pages, and one of the pages was night, and you can see. I cross-hatched the night time very densely. And I was planning on moon, for Mooncock cross-hatching the sky like that with sort of six layers of dark cross-hatching. And I just realized it was slightly distracting and it probably would have taken another year to do the book. So I, I decided not to do that. The, the cross-hatching in Mooncock doesn't take that long. Some of the pages might take a, an afternoon, but I, you know, by the time I'm cross-hatching, I've sort of, I've figured out the story, which is the really painful part. I've done the drawing, which is tricky. And it's like a sort of, by then I'm usually reasonably happy with things. So I can, I can listen to an audio book and, and just quietly cross-hatch away, maybe in the evening rather than in the daytime. So it's, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite enjoyable in a funny way. No, oh, good. Good. And just in case you guys don't know, cross hatching is is the, the little the little squared lines where it's this and then that and then that. And then, yep, yep. Cross hatching. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, we have a question from the internet from Peter Wong. Peter asks, uh, "Moon Cop paints a view of space colonization as something without air." Are these your views of space colonization? What's the oh nine to five without air? Is that what that says? Oh, Doug's on the phone, so I can't I can't ask for clarification. Um, as a nine to five without air, are these your oh, views? I, is this yeah. your view of space colonization? Let's 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 go to that one. Um, I don't I don't know if it's my. It's, I mean, Moon Cop isn't supposed to be a realistic idea of space colonization. I suppose what I was thinking of with Moon Cop was. That time, I guess, in the late 60s and early 70s, when everybody was, it seems like everyone in the world was excited by space and by going to the moon. And we, you know, I would, I would read books when I was a kid, which would, I guess I, I was growing up in the 80s, but some of the books were coming from the library, so they were a bit outdated. And they'd talk about living on the moon in 2001 or... One of them talked about the Olympic Games possibly happening on the moon in 2020, which is the next Olympic Games in Japan. And just that slight sadness that um, these days we don't have that rather childish optimism about technology and about the future. And I, I guess that's what Mooncock was about, was about thinking of, you know, the, the world it's set in is almost as if that optimistic future came true or um the, the future in stanley kubrick's 2001 kind of came off so i guess that the, the 
the, the story in Mooncop is a bit about the difference between dreams of what the future will be like and and I think the reality that whatever happens human beings are almost always the same and things will break down things will not work people will have quiet moments not in a dreadful kind of awful terminator type dystopia where everything goes wrong but just things won't technology won't make our lives perfect and we'll still be people who get disappointed and and moon cop i guess is is a is a caricature of that idea so i suspect i i don't know what real space colonization will be like but i you know i just think about i was some of my earliest cartoons i did were about the um, some astronauts bickering and having ordinary time on the moon and just being ordinary humans. And I read a lot of transcripts of the things that Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong said to each other on the moon. In fact, the complete transcript of everything they said. And it's, most of it's really banal. And that was what struck me, that, that it's not all about heroic statements of a, a one, one grand step for man or whatever it was. There's a funny moment when Neil reminds, Buzz reminds Neil that he mustn't lock the door because they can't get back in again if they lock it. And there's a point where one of them, one of them falls over and has to be helped up. And just those sort of human moments seemed interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, uh, if, if, if we did go into space, would you, would you want to go or would you want to stay here? Oh, I, I, I mean, if, if, you know, if there was a moon colony, I'd certainly love to go there for a couple of days. But I, you know, it's like as a kid, I think I imagined I'd like to live there. Or I don't think it would be that much fun to be on the moon after a little while. It's, it is just rocks. I think you'd enjoy a bit of bouncing around on the first day and looking at things and marveling at the Earth. But I think it wouldn't take long before you were just, you know, maybe a bit bored and wanted to come home. Yeah. I think you had a question. Um, yeah, because I mean, the previous statement sort of tied into my question, which was like, yeah, why is Moon Cop there? Like, did they, did they think that in a colony that they needed to have some kind of police protection or did like a crime happen? And so they were like, we need a cop, but his crime rate is always 100%. So is he just there as like a figurehead? Well, I think that, that, that what I wanted to suggest was that, you know, if you look at the, the landscape of the moon colony, the, there's, the buildings are quite sort of spaced out and there's a lot of emptiness. And in one of the first drafts, there was an incompleted highway that he drove along a very little of. And the, the idea was that the whole place had this optimistic idea that everyone would want to go up there and, and build a little house and live there. And they've built this big spaceport and all these things in the hope that everyone will get excited by this dream and, and, and go to live there. So he is, I don't know if there used to be more in, in, in the world of that, if there used to be more police or just the, the assumption was that, I think maybe there were, I think there was probably three or four of them at, at, the, at the height in, in the hope that the, the people who arrived would need looking after and it's just kind of people just maybe w went there for a weekend and then went back and nobody they could couldn't quite persuade people to move there so that's why there's there's now only one policeman oh. makes sense to me did uh, anybody else have questions so um uh, we uh we started a book club at my high school um and my students read it and they immediately wanted to know why a love story because they they immediately connected moon cop as being a love story i didn't see it that way um maybe because i'm an adult but they okay. certainly saw it uh completely as a love story okay well that that was um from the very beginning in my head i wanted it to have a romantic element and i didn't want the story to be you know, the arc of the story is pretty much just down. Everything is going wrong for him. The colony's going down. He's depressed. It's, it's kind of, it's not going well. But I didn't want the story to end on a complete downer. And I wanted just the, the, the littlest sort of uptick in the feeling at the end. And I thought that it was, about, that would have to be about him making human contact. And the girl in the donut shop 
who I guess went there in my mind because of my of that those cliches of cops and coffee and donuts. So that just ended up in my thought process that there was a donut shop and then there was a girl, and that felt like his chance to have some human warmth. Um, and I wanted the, I wanted it to have a, a love story ending, but I, I, I didn't want it to be cheesy. And it, I, it, was, it was tricky. I really wanted it to be the subtlest feeling of things are going to work out for them, but without me doing too much there. So it was very, I was trying very carefully to get, to get an ending which was warm, but not cheesy. And, and to write her character so she wasn't just a sort of... Um, wish fulfillment useless character you know i wanted her to feel kind of smart and clever but i didn't want to 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 signal that too strongly so it was all just trying to be quite subtle about it and i guess i just i th my last book goliath was had a totally tragic ending and i thought it'd be nice to try and work my way towards a happy ending even if it's only the tiniest little beginning of a happy ending and I also wanted the kind of joke in there to be that he actually only manages to, you know, uh, make a move towards getting the girl when he realizes that they're the only two people left on the, on the moon. A little bit like that, you know, if you were only if you were the last person on Earth, would I consider you a kind of a, a hopefully funny version of that. Yeah, I uh, actually I thought the ending was was very hopeful. I you know, and and kind of happy that that I don't know. I mean, maybe they don't even maybe they don't ever have a relationship past that. But just sitting and staring at at the Earth, that just seems peaceful and quiet. Yeah, yeah and he's, and he he's finally done something. I mean, up till then he's been pretty passive, and it's like it's a small thing, but he's 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 done something. He's made a move forward. So he's. I think whatever, he's not stuck the way he has been stuck throughout the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the room, comments, thoughts? I'm going to do all the heavy lifting. No? Only one, only one question from, from the high school. Well, I mean, the, uh, the other question they had was about the, uh, it's coming escaping me, the robot. A lot of them, the, the uh -huh. robot that they send, uh, the they were wondering... Yeah, they were wondering if if that was the idea that you had had you gone through uh, something like that in your own life, and you felt like people maybe just sent you, um, what was it that that you had just they kind of told you just to kind of deal with it. Uh, they 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 spoke a lot to me about that. Um, right. And I was I I really didn't have any real answers to say. I said I would definitely bring it up. Okay. Yeah, he does. He he gets sent a, a, a completely useless therapy robot who kind of almost immediately doesn't work. And I've never been, I've never been through any therapy. And it's not, I think that was just, I suppose in the story, he, need, he needs to work it out for himself and Mooncock doesn't engage properly um, with anyone until, as I was saying, until that I was saying. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a, it's really a really a comment on therapy. Still, seemed like a pretty insightful question for high school students. I like that one. Yeah, they get insightful. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how to answer that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did they like the book? They enjoyed the book. We read it between fourteen students, uh, not counting my own copy, mm -hmm. in about uh, four days. Wow! Nice. Wow. Nice. That's a great reaction. That's a great reaction. Um, yeah. What else? What else do I have to ask? Um, did you? It, it, so the I, I think the best review that that someone gave me. Uh, 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 just hand it to me, Doug. I was rather than trying to be like coy. Um, was uh, was that it was? I think I said this in email to you. That it was Charlie Brown in space. Um, yeah. Which, 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 you know, I really felt really kind of true and right. Um, are you, are you, uh, are you a Schultz fan? Uh, I guess might be the question from there. Yeah, well, I can, I can see why. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see why. Really, it really, has that as well. The carrots, are, the carrots are a bit peanutsy. Peanutsy. There's a. I'm sort of hearing my voice. I'm sort of hearing my voice. 
this concern. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's, we're okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and I, I guess he he hit the sadness that Charlie Brown has. Yeah, I do like I, peanut. Yeah, yeah. I like peanut. Yeah. 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 Because it, it, it almost... It, it almost seems to me like like the whole just the whole situation on the moon is is just Lucy endlessly pulling the football away, you know, in, in, <laughs> yes. in, a, in a lot of ways. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, as a as a the first newspaper strip I always read was, read was the Far Side, side by Gary Larson, Gary and, Larson. That, mm. and that influenced that was influenced someone influenced someone more than more than peanuts more than, more than peanuts. Yeah. yeah. Did you have another question? Um, yeah. Oh, man. You Sorry. forgot. Oh, I great. Got, I got super distracted for a second. You're, you're, you're like my 12-year-old. I got a question. No, I don't have a question. Um, uh, I cannot read. Is this a Sarah that this is? That's Sarah Blake. Hi, Sarah Blake. How are you, Sarah? Um, and and it, it's not really a question. It's more, it's more of a statement. Discuss the idea of hope versus hopelessness in your work. Do it now. Discuss it. Um, that's a good that's question, no? I think, I, think, I think that is something I think about with my work. And I don't want it to I don't want it to I think the, the I think world, the like, world are quite cruel. Are quite cruel and there isn't a kind God to help you. Kind God to help you. Or, or, or. They're, 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 but they are. I don't. But they are. I don't think the hope comes from people connecting with each other and talking to each other and other and other. And I think that probably comes down. And I think that probably comes down to my life. But that's what's it. That's what's it. Yeah. I don't remember it now. Do you remember? Yeah. Um, so why uh, was Moon Cops transfer denied because Donut Shop Girl was still there? Or like even if he was literally the last man on the moon, was it just like bureaucracy shenanigans where they were like, sorry, you're just going to... Uh. No, it was more or less, yes. No, it was more or less, I, yes. I, I, I have to look back over the exact time that, time that may have been some other people there. Some other people there. there. Yeah. Go into it. There was quite a lot of stuff I worked on about the He had to be there to protect. had to be there to protect. He had to be there. Any customer. Any customer. They are in a sort of weird, weird where they could leave or not leave, and they're sort of But in the final draft, I didn't go into too much detail of that. Okay, cool. with, with, with a book like this, there's a lot of, like this is a lot of thinking about the practicalities of the world, world that I thought about, which never appeared in the book. But I think it's quite important that, that the world I've created is sort of real to me in a way, and I, I know it. Even if, even if those things don't appear as a as a yeah, because I, I sort of wonder why there's a donut shop on the moon in the first place. I, I, for like, us? Yeah, I mean, just... Like, for <laughs> like, who built it there? Who thought there'd be enough people? Like, of all the foods in the world, like, donuts seems like the kind of food that's not necessarily eaten every day, Although you know? Although, it's such a welcome sight to see a donut shop. Mm. Like, maybe it's just, like, that little beacon of hope. I'm like, oh, God, there's nothing but rocks here, but thank God I can get a crueler. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, there, was, there was versions where I thought about explaining that more. And there is a scene where he orders some donuts. He orders a donut, and the machine goes wrong and tries to give him 12,000 donuts. And in my mind... That's kind of why the the donut shop gets upgraded from a donut vending machine to a shop because of this um, error there. But I, I didn't want to kind of I didn't I, I, I thought it was more interesting if it's if it's a very subtle suggestion. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I, uh, I I do ultimately feel that the book is just full of hope at the end. Even though it's it's sad, but it's but it's I don't know. It's bittersweet, bittersweet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Our hearts. 
just like our hearts. Well, does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts? You, come on, you guys must have something to say. No, nothing? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Why ultimately is everybody leaving kind of at the same time? It feels like, you know, this is kind of a culmination of something, but we don't know what that something is. And at this point, they're downgrading the apartments. The last woman who, like, you know, one of the first people left. Why is everybody leaving now? Um, I think it's more just that we've come into the story at the at the point when the, the you know when 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 the final in the final few weeks of of the colony. Um, I I feel like in my mind people have been leaving for a while, but maybe the point we see in this story is the point when he starts noticing that actually it's not just quiet, it's actually something's coming to an end, which I guess maybe something that happens with life. You don't quite notice something happening and then at some point you kind of think, oh yes, that's, it's ending now. So it's, it's, it's got to a point when he can't ignore the fact that the moon colony is, is failing. Is that metaphoric for anything that you see around you in the city or or i don't know your your own childhood i i don't know i'm, I'm reaching here but i don't i don't think no i i some people have asked me if it's a kind of um if it's to do with real performance of cities and changes and not really i mean i live in london where it's not it's quite the opposite in that people are flooding in all the time and everything's busy um i think it was just more the thing that's real is his feeling which i think most people get to some extent a feeling of is this what i wanted for myself when i was a child was i might were my exciting dreams of my life are they are they happening the way i want them to um he's it's a i mean it's it's, a, it's an extrapolation from an occasional feeling i have into a i guess a whole life for him but that feeling of you know just just i suppose mid midlife it says very it's a kind of midlife crisis in a way i think he's I don't know how old he is, but I feel like he's sort of realizing that that he has maybe gone on a slightly followed his childhood dream and has it lived up to what now he's an adult has that lived up to what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I mean, kind of literally, he's an everyman, you know, because we can't, we don't. He has no face other than a dot and a and a, and a line for a nose. Um, uh, I, I don't know why I, what I wanted to say with that. Some, someone help me here. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, so. You could easily put yourself in his shoes. Yeah. Because on, honestly, like, yeah, especially at, like this weird time of life when you're looking where you are and you're like, wait, am I doing what I wanted to be doing? And even when you are doing what you want to be doing, it's like, this was not at all what I at all a weird thing to come to terms with yeah so i guess the question the question would be then is is how is how conscious was that or or is that just something that happened um well you know i i do, I do like that idea that um if you if you draw something very simply and leave space for the audience to project themselves into it, then they can, I think, project, if you give them the right hints, project something subtler into him, into his feelings, than I could with a speech bubble, a think bubble above his head saying, oh, I feel so alone. You can, you can do something subtler and more complex if the audience is helping you with their feelings. And I like... I like I, that's what I want. Yes, and I, I guess the simplicity of the characters is is partly to invite invite that, and it's also just what I find visually attractive, and it's also that difficult question of, you know, have I got a simple style, because I'm not very good at drawing faces, which is true, but then but then I take that 
because I don't draw faces, then I find other ways of doing things. And then that becomes a positive aspect. And then those two things kind of end up intermingled in an interesting way. I mean, I, if you have, a, a, in your artistic style, if you have a weakness, I guess the question is, do you work around it or do you take it on and try and improve and, <clears throat> and stop it being a weakness? And I kind of battle with those things. I can't draw a hand. I don't know if you noticed that I can't draw hands. So in Moon Cop, everyone just has this sort of little ball thing. But I'm working on a new idea, which I think will need hands and fingers to, to tell the story. And so that's a thing I now have to think, oh, now I have to sit down and study cartoonists' hands and try and figure out a suitable hand. And it's, that's a point where I think I can't kind of write my way around that. It's it's interesting too that that in comics you're able to to do essentially faceless protagonists and and we can process that information. I don't think in any other art form you could do that. I don't. I think that if there was a film and and everybody's faces would were obscured, like the audience wouldn't be able to watch that. Like your attention wouldn't be drawn to it. Whereas in comics, I think your attention is is more drawn to it because you're you're able to, I guess, fill the cup of those characters. Yes. No, no, that's true. I was just thinking, I had a, I had a thought and, and it went because I was also thinking, I, I haven't seen the Charlie Kaufman film Anomalisa, I think it's called, which was done with puppets who all had the same face. And I think it was, quite, it was supposed to be quite a weird film. And I guess maybe it did work in some way, but it certainly drew attention to, to the simplicity. Whereas in a comic, I think it just, it's just taken as part of the story. I mean, I, I, I'm always aware because I do try and make subtle differences in expression, like a head nodding down a little or occasionally a, a, fr a tiny little frown line will appear. And I'm always reminded of a video I saw of an artist called Dick Bruna, who draws Miffy. Do you, have, do you guys have Miffy in America? No, I think M Miffy's a li is a is a ra a Dutch rabbit who looks a little bit like Hello Kitty, but as a rabbit. And I saw a video of him. He's he's very famous and has been doing it since the sixties. And he was sitting with a drawing of Miffy, and he was saying in his he's an old man saying in his Dutch accent. Sometimes I will work for hours to place the eyes just right and get the expression just right. And he was taking it so seriously and. Every Miffy face looks exactly the same. I, I, I can't recall ever seeing an expression on Miffy's face ever. And yet he's there trying to get it just right. And I do worry sometimes when I'm taking my completely simple character and moving his eye up and down and nodding his head. Is anybody noticing this or am I just driving myself crazy? Yeah. Interesting. Well... Since nobody else has anything, you got anything, EK? Sure. Yeah, all right. So you, we actually, I actually have two questions that I remembered from our high school group. And one of them is from start to finish, how long did it actually take from like mini comic to published book? That's yeah. one question. And then the second question is how did this idea originally come to you? Okay. Well, I'm, if, if I was to have, if I could have sat down and done all the work of Moon Cop in one blast, I think I could have had it done in six months or less. But because I, because it's not, because it doesn't come to me like that, it took quite a while I mean, my book Goliath came out in 2012 and Mooncock came out now in 2016. So that's four years. Um, probably the first year I was didn't even, I wasn't even sure Mooncock was the story I wanted to do. So I think it was about three years of working on it. But quite a lot of that, I'd, you know, sometimes I'd do nothing on it for three months. I'd kind of think this is a dreadful story. No one's going to be interested. And I'd put it away. Um, so it took it, it was it was very slow until I guess a bit like it builds up ahead of steam and once I've 
started showing it to people that it's coming together and uh so the the, th the the third year was probably when most of the work was done but i do i make my living as an illustrator and doing these two regular weekly cartoons so a book like mooncock really has to fit into the the spaces amongst other projects and points when i just i just don't feel like working on it so I would hope my next book won't take three years, but I'm I'm sure it'll take it'll take more than six months, I should think. Um, and as for your second question, where it came from, I, I'm going to try and show you a picture from my desktop. Let me, because there, there was kind of a few things inspired it, but this is one. Um, so I think I press. Do I press something on screen to show you my desktop? Screen share. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to press screen share now. Then, uh, then a little menu should pop up to show okay. what do you want to show of the you'll oh, have yeah. other places. Has that come up? Can you see a sort of space toy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You're muted, so. oh. um, that, that, that was one of the inspirations, was seeing this picture of this. I guess it's from this goes back to the whole 60s thing. Um, I saw this just on somebody's Tumblr or on, on fat, that thing. There's a website called Found with sort of four or five Fs at the beginning. And I'd looked there for inspiration. And I saw this toy. And almost as soon as I saw the toy, the, the, whole, the whole of that mini comic kind of came to me. I think it's just the fact that it's the, the kind of, as, as some of your questions kind of related to, you know, this, uh, this time when people imagined that we'd definitely be going to the moon, but not only would we be going to the moon, we'd, we'd need a kind of armed police force or an armed military up there because there'd be so much exciting stuff happening. And yet, if you look at the packaging on the, on the thing, it's just the usual empty moon. I mean, there's nothing there. So as soon as I saw that, I started, that's what kind of made me think, just imagine this, I mean, this is a robot, but there's other toys with with astronauts and other things like that um i think you know, there i am i'm back again uh so 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 that toy kind of inspired inspired the story and just the, i guess the difference between the the toy with the excitement and the actual picture on the packaging of him with nothing really to do and the very first idea in my head was a little robot driving around on the moon but somewhere along the way he turned into a he turned into a, a, a human. Cool, cool. No, that's 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 pretty apt. And cool. I'll, I'll, that, yeah. While I'm while I'm sharing images, maybe I'll show you a couple of other things I've got. Uh, let me see. There was one other image which was kind of related. Right. I'm just bringing it up. So this this was another ins this is kind of a, a real life inspiration from Moon Cop's apartment. It's in Japan. It's called the Nakamura Capsule Tower, and that was again a kind of 1971, I think it was built. And it's this op optimistic future where we'd all live in kind of perfect, made perfectly made little houses. It's still there today, but it's um it's kind of derelict and, and the power doesn't work and some people are sort of squatting in it. And it was just that difference between the optimism of, of living like this and then what actually happens to us today, which is kind of true of, I guess, a lot of architecture from the 60s and 70s. So that was another thing that was in my, in my mind. Yeah, by, by and large, that, that is page 30 there. Uh, that looks pretty much like, like that building. Yeah, I, I mean, I see everything. Everything that appears in the story kind of has to be simplified to fit into my world. But that was taken from there, and then there's various props and items which were taken from Stanley Kubrick's 2001. The shuttle that lands uh, at the moon base is is basically the one, a simplified version of his one. So I was kind of having fun playing with the cliches of sci-fi and items from famous sci-fi stories.
I can't hear you just now. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Sorry, we were we were muting uh, so so that so that it didn't interfere with the there wasn't any interference. It's interesting oh. to me that that so much um, of the of the kind of you know future looking architecture from the '60s and the '70s, when you look at it now, is all so cold and distant and ugly and blocky and just kind of dirty looking. Uh, 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 and and that that. The building that you showed in Japan felt the same way to me. The 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 high school that I went to, I went to McAteer High School, and McAteer has that kind of same kind of futuristic look, but it looks tawdry now rather than rather than forward. So, anyway, um, I think I think we've run through most of the questions that we have for you. Um, I wanna I wanna thank you, Tom, for for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I wanna thank you for Moon Cop. I think that we all really enjoyed this book tremendously. Um, and, uh, and it gave us a lot to think about and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think that every response that I've heard from people have been that they, they really related to it and, and everybody related to it in a different way, which is something that I found very interesting. Um, Great. And so Great. That's, it's, it's a, it's a neat, it's a neat thing. So thank you very much. Um, I want to remind everybody that our next book is rolling blackouts, which I should have had a copy here to, to show off, but here we go. The next, the next book is Rolling Blackouts by Sarah Glidden, um, and Sarah is going to be here on October 26th um, at, uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, it's a Wednesday night, so hopefully you guys can all make that one as well, and everybody watching at home will also tune in. Um, once again, thank you, Tom Gold. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it's been really fun and interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much.